Welcome again. If you're just now joining us, we've had a lot of registrations for this event. Many people, as you know, decide last minute because of work or family that they can't um, actually make it live. That's okay because Domani for Grief is recording this event, which I think is the best idea. And that way, you can always get the recording um, later on. And welcome, if you're just joining us and coming in, let us know in the chat where you are joining us from. I see Salt Lake City, welcome, welcome. Of course, I see Michigan, welcome, Jennifer, thank you. California, I see Waterford, but I don't know, where's Waterford? Uh, maybe you can tell us what state, I have no idea. Uh, that would be fun to know. Um, welcome. I'm Allison Gilbert. I'm here with Domani for Grief. I am so excited for today's conversation. Um, I'm going to give people a few more moments, of course, to log in. It's only right now at the top of four o'clock Eastern time. So we are right on time. You are not late if you're just joining us. Welcome, welcome. I've invited people um, as you are coming in just to get familiar with the setup of Zoom. I imagine most of us are, you know, by now, but in the bottom of your screen, you'll see that chat button. And if you want to, you don't have to, but if you want to, let us know what city you're joining us from, what state you're joining us from. I see, uh, oh, Waterford, Michigan. Thank you, Yvonne. Now I see where Waterford is. Thank you. I see Kentucky. Welcome, Kentucky. I am so glad that you're here. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm in New York, but we have all parts of the country on this call today. I see Utah, Provo, Utah, and I see Oregon uh, in Wisconsin, um, which is really exciting. So we have the Midwest, we have both coasts handled, Snowflake, Arizona. I recognize Snowflake from yesterday. I wonder if uh, Amanda, right? Same, uh, same uh, wonderful. I'm so glad that you're joining us again. That's fantastic. Yay, it's terrific. I'm so excited. So today's conversation um, is really separate from yesterday's discussion. So if you're joining us today, just know we had a wonderful conversation yesterday with New York Times best-selling author, Hope Edelman. Uh, that doesn't mean that you've missed anything because today's conversation is totally different, separate subject, and yesterday's conversation was also recorded. So that's great news. If you're just now joining us, welcome to the Damani for Grief webinar series. We are so happy that you are here. To get acclimated to Zoom, I'm sure most of you are completely familiar with Zoom at this point, but at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat and I would love to know where you are joining us from. We have Wisconsin, we have Arizona, we have definitely all over the country. I'm in New York. I know we have Michigan and California. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I am so glad that you are here. Um, a few housekeeping um, they're not really rules. They're just more like housekeeping agenda items that I wanted to share. We're going to talk for an hour. I'm going to be making sure that I honor that time. I know that everyone's time is precious, whether it's family or work or just something that you want to do. Maybe you want to go for a walk. And so I understand that. So we're going to keep very close eye on the time, which means I'm going to give um, a presentation to get us started. I'm going to walk us through the topic for today, which is grief and anxiety, in particular as the holiday seasons are right around the corner. This is why we are here today. So after I give a presentation, we are in a Zoom meeting and that's on purpose. 
right? We could have done this, Domani for Grief could have done this as a webinar where there's no room really for being intimate and for talking about these topics that are so um, personal. And so I love seeing faces. I hope you get comfort from seeing each other too. And we will have time for Q&A. So if you do have questions, either because you've come, you've been thinking about this, right? You've seen the Damani for Grief information and you knew that you had questions that you wanted to ask, we will get to those questions. Put your concerns, your questions, your thoughts into the chat button. Caden um, from Damani for Grief is going to help me go through these um, questions in the chat. That way I can keep looking at the camera. I won't be distracted by the chat, but what Caden will do is that he'll go through and see the themes that are popping up so I can make sure that I answer um, those questions that we hope will really be the most applicable to the most people um, who have joined this call today. I hope that makes sense. So I'll give a presentation, then I'll open it up for Q&A. Caden will help me go through the chat. So again, and I'll remind you, go into the chat, put down your questions and let me know how I can be of service to you today. This is a tough time and I'm glad that we all have stopped at least for this hour to be together and to talk about grief and anxiety. So what I'm gonna do now, give me one second, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and then we'll have a presentation again. When that's done, I'll stop sharing my screen. You'll see me again on camera and then we'll have more of a conversation. I hope that's okay. All right, so give me one second to start sharing my screen. Give me one second. Okay, I'm pressing share, so hold on. Give me one second. I hope you guys can see that, yes. Kaden, can you see that? Just the I, word, no picture. Okay. You see it just, I can see it now. It just, it just pulled up. Okay, perfect. All right. I guess it takes a second for it to populate. So again, welcome to Grief and Anxiety, How to Survive and Thrive During the Holidays. That is what we are here for today. So welcome once again. So I really want to start somewhere that is very personal to me. And it really grounds the conversation from the vantage point that I come to this conversation with. And that is this, one of the most anxiety filled times that I have ever dealt with in my life was around September 11th. This was the press ID card that was around my neck on 9-11. So you may have come to this conversation today knowing that I'm an author and knowing that I write about grief and loss and resilience. And all of that is definitely true. But where I started my career was as a TV news producer. And on 9-11, on September 11th, I was reporting the news for a local TV station in New York. And this was the tag that was around my neck that day. As the day unfolded in New York City, uh, like so many journalists do, I went towards the unfolding events that day. I got way too close to what was unfolding in New York City that day within blocks of the second tower collapsing. So this was the emergency triage tag that was put around my neck by emergency responders. You can see, of course, my name is there. You can see it says abdominal pain, difficulty breathing, uh, inhalation. Um, and of course, you can also see that it says, um, you know, one month pregnant. Uh, I thought I was one month pregnant because part of this story also happens to 
it really is very personal. So I'm sorry I got a little tongue tied. It also has to do with my parents. My mother had already um, had died five years prior to 9-11. And my father on 9-11 was terminally ill. And I was trying so hard, I'm sure many of you can relate to this, to get pregnant before my father passed away. So he would know that a grandchild was going to be on the way. So I was hopeful thinking that I was one month pregnant on 9-11. Um, alas, I wasn't, got pregnant the, the very next month. And why did we keep going? It's because he died that Friday. So 9-11 was on a Tuesday. He died that Friday. And so this coexistence of grief and anxiety is so very personal to me as well. And I have learned so much, not only from my experience, but from all the books and the research that I've done since this has happened to me and my family. Now I'm excited to share what I've learned with you and your family. So let me go back and show you the next slide on this screen which for some reason is not advancing. Okay, here we go. So this looks like a, obviously a black and white screen. I wanna talk to you about anxiety, of course, but then there's this other side about grief, right? So what is this relationship that I am talking about that connects the two? I wanna start first with some definitions to really ground ourselves in this conversation because some of us feel that we understand what anxiety is because it makes us feel we're nervous, right? Or we feel uncomfortable, but those really aren't anxiety. So let's just start with the very basics. So first of all, anxiety is fear-based. You really believe something dangerous perhaps life-threatening is about to happen. This is not just about worry, right? This is fear-based. A sense of danger is also a part of the conversation. There's not only fear, right? That was the first chain in the link, but there's a sense of danger. Something is about to happen that actually may put you at risk right, of something bad happening to you physically. So there really is this sense of potential doom that you experience in the core of your being. The last link on the chain that I want to explain to all of us here today is that anxiety doesn't have to be anything that's kind of real. It could be imagined just because it's not actually going to happen even if it's far-fetched and maybe well-meaning friends and family are assuring you, don't worry. When it comes to anxiety, it doesn't matter if it's real or imagined, it just is. And that informs our reaction to what we're about to go into now with what happens next. So what does happen when we experience anxiety? Well, I'm wondering, I see a few nodding heads. So our muscles tighten. What does that mean? It could mean just a backache, right? It could mean that maybe your shoulders get really tight. This is important to understand because sometimes we dismiss these physical symptoms as being completely unrelated to what's going on in our hearts or in our heads, what's happening with our emotions does in fact impact our physical well being. This is really important to recognize the link. Your heart could race. So now we have a potential, you know, spasm in our back. Maybe it's a spasm in your leg. Your heart can, you can feel palpitations and really your breathing changes. We're going to talk about our breathing in a second. And what I mean by breathing changes, let me be very clear. When we breathe normally, 
we may be able to take in a deep breath. When we are feeling anxiety, our breathing changes so it becomes a lot more shallow. We physically are not taking in nearly as much oxygen as we were if we were not feeling anxious. That is important. What are some of the common causes of anxiety? I do want to get into this just a little bit in our conversation today about grief and anxiety. The first and really some of the most common causes of anxiety is our concern for the safety of others. If you are joining this call today and you've experienced the loss of a loved one through perhaps as an example, an accident, it stands to reason that the next time your loved one or other loved ones leave your home, the safety of your home, you become fearful for their well being when you are not with them. That is a common cause of anxiety because you have seen that the worst can happen. So you are on edge, right? You are anxious that something may happen to others who you also love. Of course, you may have heightened concerns about your own mortality. I know this is true. This is what happened to me. So my mother and my father both passed away when I was relatively young. My mother died of ovarian cancer. So for years after my mother died, well, did I feel a cramp? And did that mean that I had ovarian cancer? I felt a shooting pain in my side. Was it because I just went for a run or is it because something was happening in my body? Again, I had seen what happened to my mom. I internalized that. And so I began to have fears for myself. I do see other folks nodding. Maybe this is resonating with your own experience. The last thing I do wanna say, and this is really important too, which is guilt, right? This is the hard one, or maybe one of the harder ones to talk about. Sometimes we do feel guilty and that could lead to anxious thinking. Maybe a child who we've lost died in such a way that we think that we should have been able to prevent it. Maybe we weren't home when something happened. And if we had been home, we think we could have stopped something from happening. Guilt is a powerful emotion and it informs anxious thinking. We're going to get to some of the remedies, but I do want to start with the causes so we can all be on the same page. Okay, I want to talk about three strategies that we can use right now to curb some of these anxious pieces, these moments, these elements of anxious thinking in our lives. The first one is, you may be like, Allison, I don't understand. Why are you showing us a young girl with a backpack who looks like she's walking to school? Reframe thinking is so important. And I'm going to use an opportunity again for my personal experience to let you know what the research shows about why reframing thinking is so important. So here's my story about reframing thinking. So after both of my parents passed away, I had my children. When they were old enough to start walking to school, going back to those causes of anxiety, I started imagining the worst, that my children wouldn't make it to school okay that somehow they would be hit by a car, they would trip and twist their ankle and I wouldn't be there as their mom. So I was imagining 
the worst case scenario. Then I re read one of the most influential books called The Anxious Parent. And I mention it because you don't have to be a parent to reap the benefit of what this author was talking about. And here's what he said. Instead of me imagining the worst case scenario, instead, imagine the best case scenario. Imagine that my children would get to school okay. Imagine that they would remember how to look both ways when they cross the street and they wouldn't get hit by a car. This is what we mean by reframing your thinking. It takes work, it takes effort, but it's a mind shift that we can control. And this is actually backed up by research that shows that it works and reduces anxiety. The next idea I wanted to talk to you about, and we're gonna be talking about three. So reframing your thinking was number one. Number two is about practicing meditation. Now I know Many of you probably have a meditative practice, but there may be many of you who might be like rolling your eyes right now, not interested. You think perhaps that you don't know what to do. It all seems kind of woo woo and how do you do it? And I need instructions, but I'm embarrassed to even ask. Well, I wanna to talk to you about three different resources that make meditating so easy. So these are my most favorite apps that you can get on your phone. You can download them. They're for free, right? The point of entry is free. And I'm going to tell you why I like these apps. Insight Timer is fantastic. If you are a reluctant meditator, you can really pick guided meditations. You can just listen to it. You don't have to do anything except listen. And you can pick the time frame that's comfortable for you. If you have 10 minutes, great. You can find meditations that are just for 10 minutes. If you think 10 minutes is way too long and you only want to give this two minutes, then you can find the meditations on Insight Timer that are only two minutes long. It's brilliant. And it kind of lowers the pressure of trying, trying meditation perhaps for the first time. Another app that I really like is called My Life. You can see it, stop, breathe, think. I wanna focus on the breathing piece. If you go back uh, just a few minutes ago when I was talking about some of the physical characteristics of anxiety. One of them, right, was about your heart racing. Another one was about that your breathing shifts. The upside, the reason why I think meditation is so important to reducing anxiety, even if you give it 30 seconds, is that it accomplishes two goals, probably more than that, but for this discussion, two goals. It regulates your breathing. So you could start taking deeper breaths and it also reduces your heart rate. So it brings down those feelings of being in panic mode. And so my life is a really cool app because it actually asks you questions. You feed into your responses into the app and it'll serve you those meditations that the app feels is perfect for you in that moment. I think it's brilliant. And I'm sure you've likely seen the ads for the app that's called Calm. I love it. It's a great all around resource. So those are the three that I most recommend. I want to talk for one moment about the third idea for, combat, for combating anxiety. And this may sound odd to you. Why would I talk about writing a letter? There is so much research about the power of letter writing, 
the power of putting your ideas either on paper or in a computer of how it brings down the temperature of anxious thinking. Why? Why does it do this? When we write down our thoughts, we get them out of our head and it's almost like a purge. We are purging onto the paper those thoughts that may be ruminating in our minds that we cannot stop thinking about. I'm sure many of us have been there where it is a repeated track of the same worries or the same concerns and we can't stop the thinking from happening. It seems overbearing. It's overpowering in many ways. And what the research shows, if we write down our thoughts, we get them out of our head and somehow it stops the rumination from happening. Now, this talk is also about the connection between anxiety and grief. And I do wanna spend just a moment talking about that. There is an amazing researcher, his name is Bob Niemeyer. And what Bob Niemeyer talks about when it comes to grief and letter writing is this. It is one of the only opportunities we have to establish dialogue with our loved ones who have died. And let me explain. When we write a letter to our loved one who has died, we imagine the conversation, the thoughts, the thinking, the dialogue that might have been there if our person, if our loved one were alive. We can imagine writing to them because we can hear them maybe in our thoughts responding to what we are saying in our letter. And what Bob Niemeyer would say about that is that doing so establishes and reconnects us to our loved ones, even on paper in ways that other tethers can't even come close to. We get that bond because we can imagine their response to the words that we are putting on paper. And of course, it lowers the blood pressure when it comes to anxious thinking. So writing a letter is a great, great opportunity. Now, this is, of course, about grief and anxiety. We talked initially about anxiety. We went through that chain to discuss what anxiety is. We obviously went through the physical um, consequences of anxious thinking. Now I wanna talk about grief. I wanna talk about what's next. So we have anxiety, but how is that really related to grief? So much about loss is out of our control. So we are passively getting those experiences on our laps, right? Even if a loss is anticipated, in the case of my father, I spoke about him, we knew that he was going to pass away. In the case of my mother, we knew she was going to pass away. And yet the actual time of their loss is completely out of our control. We have to be passive because there's nothing else that we can't stop it from happening, right? So here is the difference. When loss is new, so much is out of our control, including how people respond to our losses. And here's what I mean by that. When someone we love dies, generally speaking, we are the passive recipients of support. Maybe if we're lucky, people come over in non-COVID times to our homes. They may be with us in person. They may drop us, 
drop off food to bring us comfort. They go to a cemetery and we gather. We are passively receiving support. What is so interesting about what comes after loss is that the remembering is up to us. When we move from passive mourning to being proactive about remembering our loved ones and keeping their memory alive, we reduce anxiety that comes with the fear that our loved ones will be forgotten. So the more proactive we are after a death to keep our loved one's memory alive, that bit, that transition from being passive while we are mourning to being active for the rest of our lives while we are remembering and keeping their memory present not just for ourselves, but maybe for our children and our grandchildren. That peace, that bit of proactivity, that calms anxious thinking. So I know this conversation is about grief and anxiety. And I also know that we also want to focus about the holidays that are coming up. And I do too. So I'm right there with you. So I want to talk about five ideas that we can all think about right now as we get ready for Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah and all the holidays that are coming around the corner. So here are five activities that you can do right now that take advantage of what I just talked about, moving from passive mourning to active remembering as a tool to reducing anxiety. Number one, let's get ahead of the holidays. And what I mean by that is this, and let me explain what this actual, this beautiful illustration is of. Let's get ahead of the holidays. So this illustration means those are keys with a little ribbon that's meant to be like a Christmas ornament, right? So what can you do with this much time between now and the holidays to be more intentional about how you keep the memory of your loved ones alive? In this example, we went to a junk drawer that a loved one you know, left behind and it seemed that it really should be classified as a junk drawer and how could these possibly make us honor our loved ones in ways that actually feels satisfying or fulfilling? Well, I believe that we can really make holiday trinkets and gifts out of virtually anything that our loved one left behind. And it's not just for us, it's for other members of our family. So in this example, we took a couple of keys that seem to have been just discarded, but then we coupled them together in a pairing of four, did a ribbon, and now that could be, if you liked it, it could be a lovely gift um, to give a family member or a friend who is also grieving that same loss. There are so many opportunities to go through your loved one's clothing. Maybe it's your loved one's um, you know, shoes, maybe it's your loved one's collectibles, maybe your loved one collect, you know, marbles or, you know, cards if, if they, if they enjoyed playing, let's say, um, you know, blackjack or something like that. What are those objects that you can then repurpose for the holidays? And now before you spend a dime shopping for the holidays, Think about what you already have from your loved one that you can repurpose and make your loved one the focus of the holidays because now you have the excuse to talk about your loved one, to say the name of your loved one out loud. So think about getting ahead of the holidays in this way. Number two, let me see why this is not, there you go. Sorry about that. Listen to their favorite music. So we are very lucky these days when we have such, you know, technology like Spotify or what have you. 
I think we can make our loved ones favorite playlists and we could share that playlist with other members of our family. We are now, of course, in COVID-19 where so many of us are not going to be together physically for the holidays. But music is one of those incredible tethers that really can connect us. So think about your loved one's favorite type of music. So whether or not that was show tunes or jazz, you can also think about specific songs. And again, if you make music, which is an incredible tether to the past, make that a part of your, if you're having a Zoom Thanksgiving or a Zoom Christmas, music can really be a part of that to make it more intimate and more special. Prepare their favorite meal. Of course, we all have favorite recipes that are handed down in our generation, but that's the beginning. The beginning is starting there. With Zoom now, we can all cook together. It's not ideal, but let's say you all wanted to make a festive holiday meal all at the same time in all different locations, you could do that. One more way to amplify cooking as a way of staying connected to our loved ones is this. If you have children in your home and they're part of your bubble during this time, if you arm them with a shopping list when you go to the grocery store, you can have them approach cooking and baking and shopping for grandma's favorite and most famous pumpkin pie together and get the recipe and the ingredients for that famous recipe together. Because the more we include children in these opportunities and make it active and fun, making a scavenger hunt in the grocery store for these ingredients, I think the more we're going to have children also remember the loved ones that we don't want them to forget either. I hope that makes sense. I can always come back to this again. When I am done giving the presentation, which will be shortly in the chat, please remember ask me your questions. If anything that I'm saying is unclear or you want me to you know, talk a little bit more about it, I'm more than happy to do it. So if I'm getting to you in some way and you want to kind of you know, add on to what I'm saying, please enter that into the chat. This is a dialogue and I'm really excited to hear from you when we get to that part of our presentation today. Okay, another really great idea. Seek nature. Again, we are talking about the most important ways to approach our losses during the holiday. It may surprise you that I'm talking about going outside. I do recognize that it's getting cold in many parts of this country, including where I am. Nature is so important to our well-being. There have been dozens, if not hundreds of expertly written research papers about the importance of nature for lowering our anxiety. Let me give you the reason why in a nutshell. So much of our lives are spent in care of others. Either we are doing work for others and that takes our time and our energy whether or not we are caring for our families, and that takes time and energy. Most of the time, we are in service and we are in care of others. When we go into nature, do you know what happens? The birds sing and they ask nothing of us in return. The wind blows and we hear the rustling of the leaves and the wind and the leaves ask nothing of us in return. It is the only relationship where we can take and we can keep taking and there's nothing required of us in return. That also reduces anxiety and it's been proven. 
So my unsolicited recommendation is get your long johns now, get your hats, get your gloves. Uh, I think that winter weather uh, can be an excuse for not going outside and seeking nature. But I say, why let that be a deterrent? If you are able, if you are physically willing to go outside, even if it's just to step your toe out your front door, the smell of the air and nature is really restorative. The last idea I wanted to talk to you about in terms of anxiety and grief, especially for the holidays, is because of this. Using social media to your advantage, especially around the holidays, is really important. So what do I mean by that? So my mother's name was Lynn. And so when you put a hashtag, hashtag remembering Lynn, it's a way of everyone coming together under the same umbrella to share and reflect and to remember even when we can't be physically present in the same room. So it's like forming a digital water cooler experience about your loved one. So what does that mean? for you. I encourage you to put on social media a question to your family, to your friends. How are you remembering that loved one who you share together? Ask questions, share stories. And the proactive piece, going back to being passive versus proactive, if you post a picture of your loved one for the holidays, that is an invitation for your friends and your family to post their memories of your loved one too. I think that many people are scared. They're scared to bring up our loved one in conversation. They're worried that bringing them up will remind us of our losses. And we know that we don't need their reminder. We know our loved one isn't here. So by us being proactive, by putting a photo of our loved one online, whether or not you use a hashtag, it doesn't really matter. You putting it on social media encourages, invites, and lets others know, you know what? It's okay. And I want you to remember my loved one with me. Join me. Do this with me. It'll help me heal. So I want to recap just for a second, and I will open it up for questions in our chat. A recap of what we're talking about when it comes to anxiety and anxious thinking. So number one, my top remedy for making anxious thinking less pronounced is to simply reframe our thinking. It's a mind game. Instead of imagining the worst case scenario, try to imagine the best case scenario. Number two, practice meditation. I talked about three apps that I feel are really worthy of your consideration. Sometimes when we say, you know, go meditate, you don't know where to start. You don't know where to begin. In these examples, you put them on your phone, you put on your headphones and you just listen and you let them do that work for you to introduce you to what meditation can do to reduce anxiety. And number three, we talked about writing a letter. It sounded odd, right? How can letter writing reduce anxiety? And what I talked about is that it restores some of our ability to imagine conversations with our loved one. And in that example in particular, if you remember, one of the outcomes of anxiety, or one of the causes, I should say, I misspoke, one of the causes sometimes is guilt. Letter writing is a perfect outlet to let go of the kind of anxiety that is caused by guilt. 
All right, let me now talk about the grief component of this conversation in terms of the holidays and how we can keep the memory of our loved ones alive. And by doing so, introduce proactivity, reduce passivity, and that's how we're going to reduce anxiety too. Get ahead of the holidays. We know they're coming. Don't let them blindside you. Take a moment to think about what you already have in your home that you can repurpose and give as gifts to others in your family, maybe to your loved one's friends who don't have anything from your loved one. That is an excuse. That is the perfect opportunity to crack open moments to talk about your loved one, to keep their memory alive and to say their name out loud. Don't let the holidays creep up on you. My number one advice is to be proactive and get ahead of the holidays. Number two, listen to their favorite music. Now this can also be very holiday specific, right? Maybe your loved one liked certain holiday music. That could be wonderful. Whatever transports you and strengthens that tether that you feel with your loved one, that's the kind of music that I'm talking about. And the other piece, if I wanna remind you of that, is to share that playlist, whether it's Spotify or another platform, with your loved ones so you can listen in community and have that be just an uplifting tether to your loved one too. Number three, cook their favorite meal. It could be the tastes, it can be the aromas, and the one unexpected opportunity when it comes to cooking their favorite meal, if you remember, is arm children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews with a shopping list. And so when they go shopping to help you buy the ingredients for grandma's famous pumpkin pie, they will then own for themselves more about that connection to that recipe because you allowed them to be a part of the cooking, part of the shopping. That's how children learn, right? They learn by doing. So think about that perhaps in a little bit of a different way. Number four, we talked about seeking nature, really lowering the pressure of anxiety, so important during the holidays. And I know now because of COVID-19 and the warm weather, we have all enjoyed being outside. However, winter, as we know, is coming. Depending on where you live in the country, it will be cold, very cold, very soon. Gather your mittens get your gloves, get your hats, allow nature to really lift you up. As I said, it takes nothing to go out into nature. It doesn't require anything of us except to be there and let the healing power kind of, you know, roll all over our shoulders. So definitely seek nature as a restorative um, antidote when the holidays get a little bit more stressful. And number five, put the social in social media. I talk about using hashtags to get your family to kind of gather around one theme on social media. Um, I use the example of hashtag remembering Lynn in honor of my mom. If that's not your you know, cup of tea, that's okay. Really what I'm talking about here is allowing your friends and family on social media or even your acquaintances to know that it's okay to talk about your loved one even though they are not here this holiday season. If you bring up your loved one, if you post a picture of your loved one, if you ask your friends and family to share their memories and their photos of your loved one too, look what you've done. You've cracked open a moment where they can feel safe to share their reflections with you because you've communicated to them, it's okay. 
you're not going to upset me. In fact, you're going to share my memories with me this holiday season. I want to end on one fun photograph before I stop sharing my screen and I take your questions. So this is one of my prized possessions. This is a photograph of my mom in the middle. Of course, that's me and that's my daughter. Now, if you remember what I said during this presentation, I mentioned to you that my mom died relatively young and my daughter never met my mom. Hmm. So you might be wondering what I did to get this picture across three generations. Well, this was the original photo of my mom and me. And with the power of Photoshop, I just inserted the picture of my daughter next to my mom and me. Now, why did I do that? I did it because especially during COVID-19, when all of us are in our, in our homes so much more, we have time to maybe be creative. And so in this example, I could allow my daughter to see for herself what I see. What are the physical traits that link her to the grandma she never got to meet? So I see the eyes looking fairly similar. I see the eyebrows. I see um, her cheeks. I see lots that I feel connect her with my mom, her grandma. And so by combining this picture of just my mom and me, that was the original, and then Photoshopping my daughter in, I think we accomplished something pretty extraordinary. So my daughter can see for herself um, those connections. And I think, hey, we all have a lot more time at home these days. And I wanted to end my presentation showing you how I've been uh, a little bit playing around and creative um, during COVID-19. So let me stop um, sharing my screen. Let me come back on camera. And hi, everybody again. Um, and I know right now it's perfect timing. We have 20 minutes for Q&A. I promised you I would be um, on time and respectful of all you have going on. And so I'm going to ask Caden um, to uh, go through some of the chats. If anyone has any questions, if you want to add questions, maybe you want to do it anonymously. Um, you can always message Caden in particular, but I do want to answer your questions, if you have any, and I'll be sure to keep talking if you don't, because um, I have a lot more to share if you would like me to, but I would love to hear your questions. I'm sure that you came to this conversation today really wondering um, from your own experience how to handle certain grief experiences, maybe some anxiety experiences. And I would love to hear um, anything of what you would have to say. Or Caden, if you have a question from Damani for grief, I'm happy to answer that too to kick things off. Yeah, so we have, I have a couple actually. Um, the first you talked about, um, in the anxiety portion, reframing our thinking. And one of the questions that, that we got is how can we recognize that we are, kind of, I'm trying to turn this into more of a, a story as I, as I say, okay. so how, can we, how can we recognize that we're thinking negatively or as you said, worst case scenario, and then change that I'm, I'm assuming it's got to be a conscious effort at first, but is, are there tips and anything that you can offer for how to make that more subconscious so we don't always, so we're just naturally thinking about the best case scenario eventually? Is that? Yeah, that yeah, no, I definitely appreciate that. No, you did that perfectly. Um, I actually think I'm going to be the bearer of bad news. I don't think it can be subconsciously at first. I think that is part of the wonders of the human brain. We can trick it into thinking in certain patterns. You've heard about that if you um, are sad and you literally force yourself to smile. Have you heard about this? If you're sad during the day and you force yourself to smile, your brain 
switches and you actually get happier. It's true. That's what the research shows. So we have power over our brains and our thinking. And so at first it'll take work right? You'll have to consciously reframe your thinking like I had to do when my daughter and my son first started walking to school and I was imagining the worst case scenario. But now they're so much older, but now I'm not so much of a victim of that, you know, doomsday scenario. I fought it for a long time. I did. And so that's when I started seeking out expert opinion. And that's when I came across that book, which I'll mention again, it's called The Anxious Parent. And you don't have to be a parent to read it. I found there to be incredible advice in that book. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And then we, we had a couple more comments of, of individuals who have lost loved ones close to Christmas and um, just shared that it's, it's a difficult time Christmas can be difficult now because of that. Is there any advice or ways that you can celebrate and remember while still um, finding joy in the holidays? Yes, yeah, I, that's such a good question. And I really believe truly that we can and we should make our loved ones who have died a part of the holidays. One example is what I alluded to earlier, which is I think when a loved one dies, the immediate family sometimes gets overwhelmed by all of the possessions that our loved one had, right? The clothes, the jewelry, maybe it's a CD or radio collection back in the day. Uh, maybe it's sweaters, maybe it's silverware, maybe it's China, right? Plates and um, other things like that. What we take as being overwhelming and too much because of quantity, those people who used to love your loved one too, I'm thinking way down the chain. So, Think about old high school teachers, maybe college professors, maybe nurses or techs who cared for your loved one when they were ill. Maybe it's the, the guy who cut the grass. I mean, expand the circle of the people who knew your loved one. And if you're able to do two things, get rid of items that don't bring you closer to your loved one, don't bring you joy, but then give that same item to others who don't have anything to remember your loved one by, that does so much. You're ensuring their legacy endures. You're keeping their memory alive because you're sharing a physical object that they once owned. Number three, you're keeping their name alive because you're saying their name, you're writing their name. That loved one is the excuse for getting back with others who really would welcome the opportunity to talk about their friend too, right? Sometimes they don't have the opportunity to reflect on their friend who died. And so by giving an object that belonged to your loved one to them, especially for the holidays. I mean, talk about a meaningful gift for the holidays. Um, I couldn't think of anything more meaningful, more substantive than to um, you know, go through what you may consider too much and give it to others who loved your loved one who, can, who, would, who would just really honor um, that object and what a great meaningful gift for the holidays. I would love to take more questions. Uh, I know we have just a few more minutes left. So maybe one more question, Caden. Yeah. So, so with that, you mentioned going through old items. Um, I know that that can be hard to start and I, I love the thought of giving, giving items away to, to other loved ones, but is there, would it be appropriate to ask friends and other family to come to help that 
to help get that ball rolling because I know. I, yes, I love that idea. Yes, I don't think that. Um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I don't. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay, um, I love that idea. I think so much about grief and loss is too often solitary and isolating. I am a huge believer that we can do these things in community. So now, of course, the in-person part has been um, all but eliminated with COVID-19, but that doesn't mean you can't do those kind of things on FaceTime or on Zoom or Skype. There's other ways, of course, of joining together. And so if you can make what would otherwise be an isolating experience, which could be actually crippling for some people to do these tasks alone. It feels overwhelming. If you can share the burden and not tackle these projects alone and do it in community aided by technology these days, I think you're gonna be um, potentially a lot stronger. And I'll say before I wrap up, the side benefit of doing it in community is this. You crack open more opportunities to talk about your loved one, to say his or her name out loud, to share stories. So not only do you get the physical help to go through items, you get the emotional support of having yet another moment to keep your loved one's memory um, alive. And I think that's really just such a wonderful gift that lowers anxiety um, and really um, especially important to do um, over the holidays. So like I promised, we have two minutes to go, which is the perfect wrap up. So one, I wanted to thank everybody for being here today. It was my privilege, my honor to share with you my presentation. Um, really, I had so much fun um, coming up with the presentation and putting it together. I hope you found it to be of value. Um, I wanna thank Domani for grief. I mean, I am so grateful that you have provided this forum, this platform to bring all of us together. We saw when we first started the conversation that we have folks here on this call and many more who will watch this recording later who joined us from all over the country. So for this one hour, you got us all together to talk and to appreciate and to think about our loved ones. And I hope it's been of incredible value. Um, and I look forward to seeing you for the next Domani for Grief webinar. It's a series. So I look forward to seeing you guys again. And thank you again for taking this hour with me. And I, I, I really hope that you got something out of it. So thank you so much. Thanks, Allison. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I see your thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I see your comments. Thank you so much. What a privilege. I'm really, really grateful for your time. Have a great thank night, you. everybody. Or good afternoon. Bye, Beverly. Bye, Yvonne. Paul, good seeing you again. Thanks for coming two days in a row. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye, Beverly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good night, Gianna. Good night, Sherry. Have a great day, you guys.